Welcome to virtual uh, GED class. We are continuing our unit on data analysis, and today is the second lesson. We are actually going to revisit the concepts of mean, median, and mode. We're going to look at some more complex problems, GED-style problems, uh, and we're also going to discuss the concept of range, uh, which is new. Um, so I will just quickly remind you guys that mean, median, and mode are all known as measures of central tendency. Central tendency, they're ways of looking at the middle of a list. And I always try to spell tendency wrong. Two E's, no A at all, okay? Now there's three of them, there's mean, there's median and there's mode, three ways of looking at the center of a data set. And hopefully you remember, because this is what most students forget, they mix up their three Ms. So mean is what we would all have if we all shared equally. So that's when you take the total and you divide it equally among the number of items in the data set. And if you saw last class, you know how much I hate, 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 how some teachers teach that add and divide, because that's not always true. Okay, then uh, the next one was median, and the median is the centermost number in an ordered list. Notice that both of those contain the word number in them. Mean and median only work for quantitative data, for data that's in numbers. Mode, on the other hand, we said works for quantitative or qualitative data, numbers or words, and so we will just call it the most common item rather than saying the most common number, because it might be a word, the most common item in the data set. So I'm not gonna, I spent a whole lesson last time talking about this, I'm not gonna do it again, but we do need to know these three in order to do what we're gonna do today. No, and I will remind you that since these are all measures of central tendency, they all should look like they could fit really nicely into the center of a list, like they could slip into the list. If, for example, sometimes I'll give students a list of numbers and I'll ask them a question, like what's the mean? and they'll tell me 174. And I'm looking at these numbers and I'm saying 174 doesn't fit in this list. It would be very out of place, okay? Um, or they tell me, you know, the median is three. Same thing, uh, doesn't fit in this list. It would be very out of place. So all of mean, median, mode, since they're all measures of central tendency, should all look like they could fit very nicely into the center of that list. Uh, without looking out of place. Uh, let's look at a different kind of measure, a different kind of measure. I don't know why all the GED teachers got together and decided we would teach mean, median, mode, and range all on the same day. Um, it confuses students a lot because you guys assume range is the same kind of data or the same kind of a measure, but it's not. Mean, median, and mode are all measures of central tendency. Range, on the other hand, is what we call a measure of spread. Now, good news, you don't have to have this term memorized for the GED, okay? So don't go around wasting your time trying to memorize measure of spread. But what I want to point out to you is that when I look at the range, I'm not looking at the center of the data. Instead, I'm looking at how far spread out the data is. The range, just like if I talk about how far the cattle ranged, I'm talking about how far they walked, you know, uh, the distance that they go or the spread that I have for them of land. So it's how far the data is spread out. And it, uh, unlike mean, median, mode, measures of central tendency, does not need to look like it fits in the center of list. In fact, a range could be really, really tiny. It could be really, really large, um, even if the numbers weren't necessarily um, really, really tiny. Um, and that tells us something. Basically, the smaller the range is, the less the data varies. So range tells us how much the data varies. So small range, all the numbers are close together. We have a small variation and we have a large range. Then all the, the numbers are, um, you know, spread out all over the place so we have a large variation, okay? So great example is I've been a teacher now in two different environments. First, I was a high school teacher. If I were to ask the students, you know, in my geometry class, uh, how old they were, m the majority of them would say 15. Now there was one 14 year old you know there was one 17 year old who had failed math so he had to redo geometry but 
for the most part, you know, all my students were within this really small age range. Their ages didn't vary. It probably ranged from 14 to 17. This is a legit range. You can just call the range 14 to 17, but it's not the only way to do range, okay? So you can express it this way, or you can tell me how much of a spread of numbers that is. Basically, what is the difference between these two numbers? So if I wanted to find the difference between these two numbers, I hope you guys remember because this is definitely on the GED math test, not even in this context, but difference is always positive. Difference is always a positive number. So I'm going to start with my higher number, 17. I'm going to subtract out my lower number, 14, and I can see that the I have a very small range. Uh, the data only ranges by three years. One way to express the range is to give me the uh, both end numbers, like say 14 to 17, the other way to express the range is just to give me the difference between the two. And you're going to do high minus low so that you get a positive answer. That's one way to make sure you get a positive answer. Okay, great. So you can see that the range of the ages in my geometry, or yeah, my geometry class was really, really small. Okay, but now I don't teach geometry anymore. I teach GED classes. And you know, a ton and ton and ton of my students are, you know, in their 16, 17, 18, 19, that happens. But I also get older students. It is not unusual for me to have a student who's in their 50s, um, you know, 60s or even 70s in my class. So that being said, I have a much larger variation. I have a much larger range in a GED class when I look at ages. Okay, so let's take a look. Let's describe the range of the ages in this just uh, imaginary GED class that I just made up. Okay, so one way to express it would be to just uh, talk about the highest number or the lowest number to the highest number. So the ages range from 16 to 72, the lowest number to the highest number. Another way to express it would actually be to subtract to see the number of years that my students span. So if I were going to subtract, I would take the higher number first, uh, then subtract out the lower number just so I could have a positive number because I want my answer to be positive. And I don't have a calculator in front of me, so let's see, what would it be? 52, 3, 4, 5, 6, 56. Y'all should check me because um, it's been a really long day and I've packed my calculators in these boxes somewhere, okay? <laughs> I think that I said this last class, but this math that we're doing right here is actually on three of the tests. It's not only on the math test. The science and the social studies test also have data analysis on them. So we're... Um, and you would have a calculator anytime you had a problem like this, it, regardless of which one of those tests you were doing. Now we know all our measures of central tendency, mean, median, mode. We know how to find a range. Let's go look at some more typical GED style problems. I have to let you know that the problems we did in the last video were a little more simplistic. I expect them to have problems of higher complexity on the GED. It's their favorite. They like complexity. They like to combine charts and graphs and tables and math concepts and word problems and students can get overwhelmed. So let's go ahead and take a look. So let's look here at some examples. Now I mixed them all up guys. I did not uh, just do a bunch of means, a bunch of medians, modes, range, because the GED test is mixed up. I'm sorry. You know, we're gonna have to think every time, wait, what are we doing here? Um, so I want to get some practice like that. So let's take a look. Number one says the record high temperature in Fairbanks, Alaska is 99 degrees Fahrenheit. I used to live in Fairbanks, so this is of particular interest to me. Uh, the record low temperature is negative 66 degrees Fahrenheit. By how many degrees does the temperature in Fairbanks range? By how many degrees does the temperature in Fairbanks range? So they gave us the two numbers we need already. We know the max temp and we know the min temp. And we said that if we wanted to find the range, we, would, we could just uh, subtract the two numbers. By how many degrees does it range? You know, we could just subtract the two temperatures. But I have to tell you that most students do their subtraction wrong right here. So let me just really quickly in red show you the mistake that students make. Students tell me, oh look, the high temperature is 99, and then I'm going to subtract that 66 that I see, and then they tell me, oh, the temperature in Fairbanks, Alaska only ranges 33 degrees, and I'm like, you're a liar. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't even make any sense. That temperature span is so much bigger than that. I used to live in a place that only spanned 33 degrees. I've lived in Hawaii, and it it's like that, you know, the coldest you get and the hottest you get is not very far apart. But man, 99 degrees is a 
really far from negative 66 degrees. So obviously this student's math doesn't make sense. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. If the high temperature is 99 degrees, and I said I would start with the high temperature when I found the range, and then from that I need to subtract the low temperature, I need you to be really careful. You are subtracting because it's a range problem. That first subtraction sign is because I is because I'm doing range and now what am I going to subtract from that I need to subtract negative 66 now students don't like to write this because it doesn't make a lot of sense to them that's okay even if it doesn't make sense to you it makes sense to your TI 30 excess calculator okay in that calculator you can do 99 minus negative 66 and you get a really E interesting answer when you do. Can you try it? Can you punch in 99? And be careful because the minus button is over on the right, right, but the negative button is down on the bottom in parentheses. It looks like a negative in parentheses. So you're going to have to use the minus sign first and then the negative. So 99 minus negative 66. I got 165. 165. Now that's more like what I would expect, a huge range in temperature from very hot to very cold. Now why did we get an answer like this? Um, if you've been with me before, you may have already learned that minusing a negative, it's like the opposite of subtracting or the opposite of negative. You can always think of a minus sign like opposite. And so what you end up having is the two negatives become a positive and that, that difference ends up adding in the end, 99 plus 66. Uh, and that's how that TI got that 165 degrees. But even if you didn't know that, you could still do that in your calculator. I don't want you to freak out because the answer is not the way you'd expect. Some students see a letter and they lose their flipping minds. Okay, so let's look at number two. It says, which expression below represents the average of four numbers? P, R, S, and T. P, R, S, and T. I want to find the average of these four numbers. Now, obviously, I don't know what these numbers are. They're, I used letters, variables, to stand in for unknown numbers. But I can still tell you the math that I would do. Even if I don't know what the numbers are, I could tell you what I would do. So somebody remind me, how do you find an average? Does anybody know? Okay, we said on the first page that, oh, we didn't say it. No wonder. So remember that an average is synonymous with the word mean. Mean and average are the same thing. So to find a mean, what we do is we take a total and we divide that total uh, by the number of items in the data set. So if I didn't know what these numbers P, R, S, and T were, but I wanted to total them, how could I total a list of numbers? So the first thing we would do is total. So just imagine that I didn't have P, R, S, and T. Imagine that I had like uh, 7, 15, 83, and 12. If I asked you to find the total of those numbers, what would you do, Salea? Add them up. I'd do that. Bingo. So I don't care if I replace those numbers with letters. If I'm asking you to find a total, I would do, I would do that as well. I would add up those numbers. So I definitely need to add 7, 15, or not 7, 15, I'm sorry. I definitely need to add up P, R, S, and T, since those are numbers I'm totaling. Okay, now we learned that that was only the first step of um, a mean or an average problem was to find the total. After you found the total, you need to divide by the number of items in the data set. So I'm looking for the average of four numbers. So that means there's four items in the data set. So I would have to divide by four. Now be really careful, you have to divide the entire total by four. Um, two of these problems look right. To students. In fact, the main wrong answer I get is people circle this one. They say, look, there it is. We're adding up the four and then we're dividing by four. But I want you to be really careful. This would give you a wrong answer if you did your math this way because there's something called the order of operations in math class. I know you guys have heard of it, but the order of operations would actually make this division come first. So you would only be dividing T by four and then it would add up all the other numbers. Uh, order of operations it does any division before it handles addition subtraction. Okay, so super important that I divide the entire grouping by four. And so I would have to do C. I would have to uh, take the entire total, and I did that using a fraction bar, not the only way to do it, and divide by four. And you'll notice if you do go back and watch the first video, Salea, that's how I write it every time because I really, really want you guys to get used to uh, using a fraction bar for dividing and grouping. That's why fraction bars are so nice. You can use it to divide uh, 
one number or to divide a whole big expression. Also, if you look at your GED formula sheet, uh, I think that is what the formula says. It, it uses a fraction bar. It looks similar to this problem when it, it has the mean formula on the formula sheet. Okay, so let's take a look at number three. Now, this is so typical of what I'd expect to the GED. I would not expect for them to give you an average of a list of numbers. I would expect them to give you your data in some other form, like in this case, a line graph, okay? So it says, according to the table below, on average, how many laps does Emilia swim per day? So again, I've said on average. So I'm looking at the mean, and what am I finding the mean of? How many laps does Amelia swim per day? So I'm gonna have to take the total laps, and we're looking per day, so what I'm gonna divide by is the number of days. So now the only hard part is pulling the item off a data set or pulling the data, I'm sorry, off of a line graph. So let me take a look at these points that I see here. There's my data. It's in the form of these points. So on the first day, I swam, or Amelia anyway, swam eight laps. So first number I see is eight. How about on the second day, how many laps did she swim? Ten. Ten. And I'm going to total these by adding them up. That would be the quickest way to do it. Now, how about on the third day? A lot of students struggle with telling me how many laps that is. 15, 15 absolutely. Saleya, how'd you know it was 15? There's not even a 15 on that graph. Because it looks like, it, the dot looks like it's right in the middle. Between yeah, right 15. in the middle of 14 and 16. And the number right in the middle of 14 and 16 is 15. You know, I've seen problems where it's not so simple, where it's like, you know, 140 on the bottom and 160 on the top. So you'd really be estimating, you know, you're like, is it 150? Is it 149? Is it 152? Hard to tell. And if it, that was the case, it would probably be a multiple choice answer. So don't stress yourself out. But yeah, use that kind of common sense. What am I between? So 8, 10, 15. Okay. So then next one on day four, I swam or Amelia swam 12 laps. And then on day five, Ah, again, I'm right between 10 and 12. I must be at 11. And day six was eight laps, and then she was tired by the end of the week, and she only swam, what, six laps? Yeah. So that's, I'm going to find the total. Then when I'm done finding the total, I'm going to take the entire total and divide by, we said, the number of days, because we're doing how many laps she swam per day. So how many days am I looking at? Seven. We good with that? Now remember, when you do this in your calculator, if you add, you're going to have to press enter first. Uh, just like we're using that fraction bar, the calculator would screw up the order of operations if you don't press enter. So I highly recommend you put this entire thing into your calculator, then press enter before dividing by seven. And I don't have my calculator, so you guys can race me as I do this by hand. I think it comes to 60. 70. <laughs> Dang it. You're absolutely right. It comes to 70. Thank you, Celia. And that's why we have calculator checks. Well, the good news is it came to 70, which is way easier than the original problem I was trying to do. <laughs> can I just say that, guys, if the math teacher can add incorrectly um, for the whole internet to see, you could definitely add incorrectly on your on your test. If you have a calculator, just go ahead and use it. <laughs> okay, so 70 divided by 10 or by 7 is 10. So she's swimming about 10 laps per day on average. Amelia is doing much better than I am this semester. This is a trick that I regularly use to screw with students' heads. I cannot tell you the number of students that I have fooled with this particular problem, and I don't say that to be proud of myself like I'm trying to trick students, but I just know the GED doesn't tend towards simple problems. They tend towards complex ones. So I really need you guys to be thinking about what you're doing and not just rote um, working through the motions or you're going to get a lot of problems wrong. So let's take a look at number four. It says Mrs. Robinson's English literature class contains three 14-year-olds, nine Oh, I said 14 twice. Dang it. That was supposed to be 13. They're very advanced 13-year-olds. Okay, so three 13-year-olds, nine 14-year-olds, 11 15-year-olds, and five 16-year-olds. What is the mean age of her students? 
We already know how to find mean. We've been talking about it. We said to find mean, first you total, and then you divide by the number of items in the data set. So I have to tell you, most students do this wrong. So don't feel bad if this is you because like 95% of students do this. They'd go, okay, uh, you know, three uh, and nine and 11 and five divided by four numbers. And they get really excited, super proud of themselves that they're over here doing math and they remembered to total and divide. And this student is very confused because I said, what is the mean age of her students? The total that I'm going to have to find is the total of their ages. And then the, if I'm finding the mean age of their students, the number of items in the data set will be the number of students. That is what I need to do. That is not what I did here. I just added three students, nine students. I totaled up the number of students. And then I don't even know what I divided by, like number of students per age. This is nonsense, okay? So how would I do this problem then? How could I find the total of all the students' ages? Wouldn't it be 13, 14, 15, and 16? Oh, that's another mistake that students make. And don't feel bad, Saleya. Same thing, though. If I only had four students, that would be right. If I had one 13-year-old, one 14-year-old, one 15-year-old, and one 16-year-old. But that's not what I have going on here. I have repeated numbers. Can you see the repetition? You've got to account for the repetition. The number 13 is happening more than one time. How many students are 13? Three. Exactly. So I'm going to have to take that 13 three times. Now, Saleya, I could have written 13 plus 13 plus 13. I'm just too lazy. 13 times three is a faster way to get there. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I have some 14-year-olds, don't I? How many 14-year-olds do I have? Nine. Yeah, so I'm going to have the number 14 happening nine times. Again, I could write 14 nine times, but how much time do you think they're going to give you on your GED? It would be faster to just do 14 times nine. Same thing with 15-year-olds. I have more than one 15-year-old. I have 11 15-year-olds. So I'm going to have that number 15 happening 11 times. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then finally, I have five 16 year olds and take a look at how I used both addition and multiplication to find my total. You don't necessarily have to organize your work like I do, but we should both be getting this big giant total. Now, what am I going to divide by? Well, I'm going to need to divide by all the students because I'm asking the mean age of the students. The students are the items in my data set. Okay, so I'm going to have to divide by all the students. So now what am I dividing by? How many students are there? Huh. I don't think, I just didn't hear what you said, Saleya. Oh, no, I just said a ton. I'm trying to do the oh, math. A ton. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Tell me what math you're doing so I can write it down. I don't know if I'm doing it right, but I'm... What are you thinking? I'm adding up... How do I, how do I word this? There's three 13-year-olds, mm -hmm. nine. I'm adding those numbers together. Yes, those are the students. Those are numbers of students. So that actually belongs on the bottom there. Those are the... Items in my data set are all my students. Ah, oh, it's a tricky problem here. So I'm going to take the total of all their ages and then I'll divide by how many students I have. And definitely you can work the bottom, you could work the top separately, but we're going to need to work both before we handle that division. And uh, since I don't have my TI, I'm forced to do this by hand. Um, but you could type either the bottom or the top in for me, Saleya, and check me since I'm apparently screwing things up on the internet right now. So 13 times 3. This is the kind of stuff that makes you grateful for your calculator. A little bit. Yep. Okay, I think I'm agreeing with myself over here. 410. Yep, I still think it's 410 over 28, guys. Yeah. Yeah? Did it work? Yep. Okay. Boom. Okay, so now it's time to divide. Will you divide 410 by 28 for me? That I... No. I'm not going to do as well on paper. 14.6 and a whole bunch of other stuff. Exactly. Um, 14.6. Give me a couple of, di one digit after that, at least, please. Four. 14.64. Okay, wonderful. Um, now, I didn't give you any rounding directions on this problem. I should have, uh, but I didn't. So if this were on the GED with no rounding directions, it'd probably be multiple choice. So I just wanted another digit so I could round it to make sure it really was did round to 14.6. And indeed, four won't matter. So yes, we'll call that about 14.6. Okay, wonderful. So what's the mean age of her students? Oh, about 14. Oh, that makes sense. Oh, a little over 14. So that makes sense for the information we're looking at. Basically, I think my warning to you is watch out for repeated numbers. 
do because a lot of times you guys miss them like i have a word problem on the internet where i say the triplets were seven the tri and just every time students get it wrong they never notice that the triplets were seven they just add in that one little seven and uh they they forget that if it's triplets we have three sevens number five i'm asking what is the range of the ages of students in mrs robinson's class the range of their ages again i like this with the problem and i'm talking about mrs robinson's class from above so i like this because sometimes students don't know what numbers to use they go oh highest number i see is 11 lowest number i see is three the range must be eight so super proud of themselves that they remembered kate's lecture and they're wrong okay because i'm asking you for the range of the ages i need the highest age and the lowest age <laughs> so what's the highest age we see um above 16 16 and the lowest age 13 13 so we have a range of only three correct answer is three or i suppose we could say 13 to 16. most likely if it was on the math test it would be in this form where you're just finding the number and if it was on the science test or the social studies we might see it like that but it'd be multiple choice if it was okay i really am looking at some complexities here okay um, GED loves giving you your data and charts and graphs. So here we go. Let's look at some data on a table in this case. Number six says the table below gives some data about some of the students in Kate's GED class. Find the median reading score of the students. Find the median reading score of the students. So first trick here is do you remember what a median is? The middle. Exactly. It is the center most number in an ordered list. So not just the middle, uh, but you actually have to order the list. I have too many students just go, okay, I'll go right to the middle of the list and there's the median. That wouldn't do it for you. We're going to have to order the list. So we want the median reading score. So I'll go straight to my reading scores. And first thing I'll do is order that list. Okay. So 5.2, 7.7, 9.2, 10.0, 12.9. And now I want the median. Okay, so one off the front, one off the back, one off the front, one off the back. And uh-oh, I have a dilemma. I have two in the middle. Do you remember what to do when I have two numbers in the middle for a median? I call this a mini mean. When there's two in the middle, we need to know the number that would be exactly perfectly and totally between them. Something higher than 9.2, but lower than 9.6 right between them and the way to do it is to treat it like a mean problem we're going to add the two together and divide just by two because we're just adding those two numbers together so 9.2 plus 9.6 would give me 18.8 .8. and if i were to divide that by two i would get 9.4 9.4 is the number that would be in the direct center of this list it would be perfectly in between 9.2 and 9.6 i don't expect the GED to be nice to you. I would expect one where two end up in the middle because they know most students forget that. Number seven, among the students in the table above, which varies more, their reading scores or their math scores? Okay, I didn't even use the word mean, median, mode, or range. I just said which varies more. Which one of those things did we say told us about variation? Does anybody remember? Range? Range tells you how much something varies. Small range, small variation. Large range, large variation. So they're asking me to compare the ranges. Which one has the largest range? Which varies more means which one has the largest range? Okay, so let's find the range of our reading scores. My highest reading score and this is so typical of a GED class, might be 12.9, subtract out my lowest reading score is 5.2, and that's a range of 7.7. .7. Now looking at my math scores, so this was reading, uh, my highest math score was a 7.7, .7. my lowest math score in this table was a 3.3, .3. the range here is 4.4 .4 of the math. So um, which varies more, the reading scores or the math scores? It's the one with the larger range. Which one has a... Say that again. The reading? 
Exactly. The reading has a larger range, therefore the reading has more variation. Now, you might have been able to tell that by looking at the numbers. Like, the numbers look further apart, but I can conclusively tell it by, for sure by finding the range. You see how they'll throw you around with words? You have to be really careful about interpreting what you read. Okay, so number eight. For which of the data sets in the table would median be a more appropriate measure of central tendency than mean? I thought I'd throw this in because even though I mentioned it in last class's lecture, when it's appropriate to use median instead of mean, I didn't give you any problems that were like this. So when do we use uh, median rather than mean? So we learned that you should use median rather than mean when outliers would skew the mean. What is that word? Out what? Outliers. outliers and it means kind of like what it sounds like an outlier lying outside it's a number that's much larger or much smaller than the other numbers we looked at a problem Soleil, last class where there were a bunch of teenage boys standing in the street corner and when we found the average of their age it was like 17 which makes sense because we had a bunch of hoodlums on the street corner okay but then we had grandpa walk up we must have been in Prescott because a little 95 year old man tottered up to them and then we took the mean again with the 95 year old man and all of a sudden I was telling you this data I was saying the average age of men on street corners is 36 you know and even though that's true, it really was the average, it wasn't very useful because we didn't have any men in their 30s, you know, standing on the street corner. We had a bunch of teenagers and grandpa. And so what happened was grandpa, the outlier, the really high number, skewed my mean. Uh, he made my mean appear uh, much different than it is. So I have a data set here that's similar. We have a bunch of numbers that are similar, but then there's an outlier an outlier, a number that's much larger or much smaller than the others. So these are the data sets I'm talking about. I have age, last grade completed, hours in adult ed, reading scores, and math scores. So I'm looking for a set where there's a really high or really low number that doesn't match the others. Do you guys see it? Is it 12.9 for reading? Oh, looking at the reading score, I have a 12.9, but I also have a 10 and a 9. Oh. And then, yeah, they're, they're, I don't, they're all within this, like, 5 range, and they're all pretty, That's yeah. I don't think it's that one, but I do have one that's much higher, and this is actually so typical of a GED class. I'm looking at the ages. Do you guys see the ages there? 25, 59. Yeah, exactly. So here I have a bunch of young adults, you know, 17, 16, not even adults yet, 17, 16, 21, 22, maybe 25. And then there is, you know, a returning person who maybe they're going for a new career or something and decided they need their GED. And, you know, they kind of stick out. It's that'd be an outlier in the class. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, yeah, Saleh is like, do I stick out? You don't stick out, Saleh. I'm not saying that. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, for which of the data sets in the table would median be a more appropriate measure of central tendency than mean? That'd probably be the age. So, number nine, pretty simple. I say, what is the mode of the last grade completed? What is the, this time I'm looking for mode. Anybody remember what a mode is? Common we, item. Exactly. Most common item in the data set. So, I'm looking for the grade that most students completed, and most of them completed 10th grade. We see a lot of 10s in this data set. 10 has the highest frequency, and so that'd be the 10th grade. Easy, if you can remember what mode is. Super easy. So then number 10, I ask, on average, how many hours have the students spent in adult ed classes on average? What do I do for average? She's like, it's not in my original notes. Yeah, that's because average is synonymous with the word mean. Mean. Isn't that mean to me? I know, that's mean. <laughs> Keep calling it average when it's mean in your notes. So total number of items in data set. Total divided by the number of items in data set, yes. Exactly. So I'm talking how many hours have the students spent in adult ed classes? So my total will be the total hours, and my items in the data set will be the students. So let's find the total hours spent in adult ed. There's my adult ed column. I'm gonna have to total those. Quickest way to total those, since they're all just a bunch of different numbers, would be to add. And I'm writing it out. And Salea, you're my official calculator person. And then when I'm done, I'm gonna divide by the number of students. There's six students in this table. That's a fairly straightforward problem. I'm gonna have to come up here because I ran out of room. So total of their ages is? One is 246. 
246. Thank you for totaling before you divide. Now divide that by six and you might get something ugly. Oh no, it'll turn out nicely. What do you get? Six divided by six. 41. Mm hmm. Oh, well, that was just a plain coincidence. That was sheer dumb luck. Okay, so on average, how many hours have the adults spent in adult ed classes? 41. Ooh, it's time to post test. Okay, 41 hours. Sorry, I got post testing on the brain. <laughs> These are all pretty simple examples. I do want to see a higher level of complexity with the average. Uh, at least the, the, the mean problems we've been doing have been pretty simple. Um, so I want to show you guys how they can kind of try to trick you a little bit with average. No table this time, just straight word problem. But let's look at some of the complexities here. So number 11 says, Mrs. P's first hour algebra class, which contains 20 seven students averaged 82.5 on the final exam. Her second hour class, which contains 22 students, averaged 86.0. Her fifth hour class with 31 students averaged 79.8 on the final. Overall, what is the average grade on the algebra final for Mrs. P's students? Looks like a pretty simple problem, but there's some complexity here. Uh, the complexity is going to be in finding the total because what is the total we need? Well, let's go look at what they asked us to find. They asked us to find what is the average grade on the algebra final for Mrs. P's students. That means we're going to have to find the total grades of the students and divide by the number of students because of the way that was phrased. Now, what too many students do is they find the average grade of the classes. They just add together the three classes and divide by three. We're not going to be able to do that because we have a lot more tests than just three tests. And we have a lot more students than just three students. If we're finding the average grade of the students, that means we need to find the total of all the student scores and divide by the number of students. It's challenging my students will be like, well, how am I supposed to find the total of all their scores? I don't know what their scores are. No, but you know what the class averages are. And the class averages are what we would have if everybody shared equally. I'm going to say that again. The class average is what we would have if everybody shared equally. So like if I look at her first hour class, that's 27 students averaging 82.5 on the test. So that average is, says that it's like all 27 students got an 82.5. It's like all 27 students got an 82.5. So even though I can't see their individual scores, I could find the total of period one scores by multiplying. So I'll do that for period one. I'll take 27 times 82.5. I'll find the total of period two's uh, second hours algebra class, which was 22 students who averaged an 86.0. And I'm going to find the total of the fifth hour class where 31 students uh, had an average of 79.8. Now, I'm organizing my work a little differently this time. That's fine. But I'm just working to find the total. So help me out here, O Salea of the calculator. What is 27 times 82.5? 2,227.5. Wonderful. Thank you. And how about 22 times 86.0? 1892. And then 31 times 79.8, please. Uh, 2,473.8. Cool. Now I have all the classes totals and I can total those up, uh, class one, class two, and class three by adding. And we can see if you want to race here too. But you should check me, Salea, because I keep messing up. I think you're going to get 6,593.3. Let me know. I got 6,593.3. Sweet. Okay, we got the same thing. So that's the total grades of the students. Now, if we really want to find the average uh, algebra final grade for the students, now I'm going to have to divide by the number of students because the items in the data set are the students. So how many students are there? Well, if we have 27 students in the first class, 22 students in the second class, and 31 students in the next class, that is a total of... 80. 
80. Yeah, so I'm going to have to divide my 65, uh, 93.3 by 80. And once again, I will ask you to do that in your calculator. Okay, how many of the numbers after the decimal do you Just want me give to give you? Give me two decimal places so that I can round to one. Okay, 82.41. And the only reason I made that choice, Saleya, is because I saw how that's how all the other ones were rounded. One decimal place, one decimal place, one decimal place. So I figured that's how she rounds. So I'll round to one decimal place. We'll call that 82.4 uh, on the average student grade on the final. It's tricky. Definitely, I'm going to put practice up for this. I would not, would not move on from this topic without trying to practice problems like this because they often stump students. Okay, so what else could they do? They could give you a current average and tell you that this student is not pleased with their current average and wants to raise their grade. This is, students come to me all the time. They say, Kate, or at least they used to, what would I need to get on my final in order to pass the class? Okay, so as it turns out, I'm like, you should figure that out. I'll give you a point extra credit, you know, <laughs> when you ask your math teacher math questions. Okay, so let's take a look. Angela currently has a 78 test average in math class after taking four tests. How high will she need to score on the fifth test to raise her average to a B, which of course is an 80% in most schools. Okay, so she's got a 78 average after taking four tests, but she doesn't want a 78 average. She wants an 80 average. There's different ways to do this problem, but I think the easiest way is to compare the totals. That's what I would do. I would compare the two totals instead of comparing the averages. Um, and so that's what I think that I'll do. If she has a 78 on four tests, it's like she got a 78 score on each of those four tests. And that's her current point total. 78 times 4. So what is that? 280 and 32, 312. Check me, Salea. Does she currently have a total of 312 points? Yes. Wonderful. But she doesn't want that. She wants to have a total of, uh, I don't know yet. So let's figure that out. She wants to have an average of 80 on not four tests this time, but on five tests. So that would be like 80 times five total. 80 times five is 400. She has 312 total points right now. She wants 400 in total to points right now. How much does she need to make up? The difference between those two numbers. So I will take the 400, subtract out the 312, and it looks like she's got to get an 88 on the next test. She had better study. Certainly, this is not the only way to do this problem. I think it's just the easiest way to think about. Similarly, on 13, a lot of students would struggle, so let's take a look. Man, I spelled out that name. I don't even know how to pronounce it, and I spelled it myself. Jaquin. Jaquin. Okay. Yep. Currently has an 82 test average after taking three math tests. If he scores 100 on the fourth test, what will his new average be? So too many students just take the old average, add the new test score, and try to divide. And that is not going to work because that old test average is not just for one test, is it? It's for how many tests? The 82 average was after taking three tests. So three tests. So it's like he had an 82 three times. Does that make sense? Yeah. And now I can add in his new score of 100, and I'll get the total of all the, if he scores 100 on the next, on the fourth test, what his new total would be. So let's see, 82 times 3 would give me 246. If I take that 246, I add in 100, I'll have 346. That will be his new total after his new test. But average is found by taking the total and dividing by the number of items in the data set. So, how, and we, they told us, you know, what will his new average be? So we are going to have to divide. What should I divide by? So I'm looking for his test average. So I need the total test scores divided by the number of tests. Does that make sense? So how many tests has he taken? So he just scored 100 on the fourth test. We've put in the fourth test now. So I'm going to have to do 346 divided by four. And I don't know why I wrote that line right there but we can race Salea. It's much easier with whole numbers. You can do it in your calculator if you, to check me. I got 8.5. Um, that's because I, skip, I didn't type in all the numbers. Oops. Okay. 
I was like, definitely should be in the 80s. No, I got 86.5. That makes sense. I got 86.52. Awesome. Okay, so even if he scores 100 on the test, he's only going to get up to an 86.5. Okay, and that will be his new average. Okay, I've gotten just about as tricky as I've got uh, for average problems on the GED, uh, barring one trick. I do, um, students often struggle with doing mean, median mode off of what's called a frequency table. We'll do that a little later. I want to introduce you to a frequency table before I start taking mean, median mode off of it. So we'll be looking at that over the next couple of weeks. Uh, but for now, this is about as tricky as I got. I just want to say thank you for joining me. I love not talking to myself. And Saleh, so nice to have you back in class.